continuing on, thinking about life and having a full power of living. I, I want to talk to you this morning about the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, one of the people I miss when I preach about the Holy Spirit is, is Roger Parker. Roger always enjoyed hearing the message preached and the Holy Spirit being mentioned and preached about because he says, that's who God gave me. And uh, so I often think when I'm preaching on the Holy Spirit, I think about uh, Roger Parker and his just love for the Lord and how he was so in tune with the Spirit living in him. I believe if you knew Roger, you would say the same thing. Uh, he was just that type of man. And, and so I want to talk to you this morning about the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Uh, and if you are a baptized believer of Jesus this morning, God has given you himself through the Holy Spirit to live in you. And so it's like Chris said earlier, if you didn't bring him with you, if you don't feel him because you didn't bring him with you, because God also gives us the choice to either follow him or not, let him have reign in our life or not. Remember that Romans 8 passage that I shared with you this morning? It says what? We have an obligation, not to the sinful nature, but to the spirit who lives in us because of Christ's sacrifice for us. Sometimes, though, we don't let him have full reign in our life. In 1935, a, a man named Blasio Cugicio. I know it sounds weird, but that's the way you pronounce his name. He's a, he's a school teacher in Rwanda, uh, and, and he realized that there was, he was having, struggling with this sense of powerless in, in, in his own life and in his church and his own experience with God. And so he did what he should have done. He withdrew for a time in his own life, and, and he went away for about a week into his prayer closet, so to speak. He just kind of shut himself in, and, and he went through a time of prayer and fasting. By the way, I enjoyed our time of prayer and fasting yesterday morning uh, when the men came together. We had about six men who came together, and it, it sounds more spiritual than we forgot our breakfast. But no, we really did enjoy our time of prayer, I did. But anyway, so, so Tablasio goes into his prayer closet, and he, he spends time alone with God for, for about a week. And when he came out, he said he, he found a new experience. He found a, 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 a newfound love for God. He found something that had been missing in his life. As a result of that, because of him being a school teacher, he goes back in, in, into his school, and he begins to preach Jesus. And, and so as a result of that, uh, revival begins to break out. Isn't that what we all want? We want to be able to, you know, years ago you could preach Jesus in school. You could talk about him more. And, and, and we, don't we want revival to break out? I, I think that's the problem with society today. We don't have enough revival. We don't, we don't have enough personal revival. We can have a revival service and then we can even promote revival. And then we get 25 or 30 people show up to a revival service. And, and people don't want revival. You see, you've got to let it start with you. You can't go to the church and have revival and leave it there and come back tomorrow night and have revival and come because if not, you, you're just playing church. You're, you're doing the service, but you're not letting revival take place. Brother Bob Molden says whenever he preaches a revival, he preaches the same message on the first night about how, you know, revival starts. If you were to draw a 36-inch circle around you and you stand in it, he said, there's where your revival begins. If nobody else shows up, there's where revival starts, right inside of that circle. You see, that's where the Holy Spirit does his work. He starts in you. So, so Blasio, he, he's doing, he's doing his, his revival, uh, and he's preaching, and revival breaks out. And so as a result of that, uh, he was asked to go over to Uganda, and the Anglican church had asked, to share, asked him to share with them about what had been taking place in his life. And so he goes there, and, and he's seeing lives changed because he's simply preaching Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And as a result of that, lives are beginning to change. Unfortunately, within a week, he comes down with a severe fever and he dies. And you may be thinking, wow, how terrible that is. But if you were in Sunday school this morning, you realize that maybe God puts you in a place to accomplish something that you weren't really thinking that you were going to do. And so he ends up dying. But as a result of that, the revival fire spread through that land like never before in such a long time. And people's lives were changed. You see, God can use you. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is like a fire. If you've ever read the book of Thessalonians, Paul says, says do not put out the Spirit's fire. Your older translation says what? Don't quench it. Don't quench the Spirit. 
And, and so we realize that, that this, the, the fire of the Holy Spirit should be burning in us. It should be something that says, man, there's something alive, there's a warmth, there's, a, there's something there that makes a difference. I think that is what makes Christians stand out, don't you? And so this morning, I want us to kind of look at that in a more deeper way. I think that's what it takes for every generation. Somebody who just lets the fire of the Holy Spirit get in their life and really take hold. And if you're a Christian this morning, I want you to know something, that if you're a Christian, that God has given you His indwelled Spirit. If you've been baptized into Christ, the Bible tells us that He has given you Himself as an indwelled Spirit. Well, Jesus prayed this in John chapter 14. Verses 16 and 17, the Bible says, Jesus says, And I, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Didn't say, you're going to come to church and experience him, and then he's going to stay there, and then you're going to go home, and, and, and you need to try to get back by the church at a certain point in time, because he's going to show up again, and, and hopefully you'll have some type of experience there, and then you go home, and, and, and what does he say? He's going to give you a counselor, and he's going to be with you where? Forever. And he is the spirit of truth, the Bible says. The, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, the Bible says. But you know him. Here it is. For what? He lives with you and will be where? In you. So I don't have to worry about going to the first church or whatever it is down the street, showing up on Sunday morning at an appointed time so God can be there and I can know that I was in his presence. Now, we love the collective worship. We love the experience that know that the Holy Spirit is working in a, in a common unity of the body of believers so that we know that we're walking in the will of God. But, but look, that's not the only place you find him. He comes with you. And so, so prior to Jesus' ascension into heaven, uh, the Holy Spirit had been working in the lives of Jesus' disciples, but Jesus says, look, now I'm getting ready to go back. And so in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says this. He says, I've got to go back into heaven, but look. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, uh, telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Isn't that amazing? Why? Because the Holy Spirit's going to come. He says, well, you're going to receive what power from where? On high. Not through me. It doesn't start here. It starts there. And when the power comes, oh, you're going to, you can't help but what, what's, the, what's the main purpose? Tell people about Jesus. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, tells us how on the day of Pentecost, how we receive that gift of the Holy Spirit. And Peter gets up and he's preaching in a sermon and, and, and the, Spirit, the, the Spirit's been just promised to other people, not just to the disciples who were standing there preaching. After, they, after all, on the day of Pentecost, what, what did they see? Remember we talked about the fire of the Holy Spirit. And he said, what did he see? He said they saw tongues that looked like, what? Cloven fire. And people, God wanted people to know the Spirit had showed up. And so Peter then says, it's not just for us, it's for you. And look what he says. He says, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive, what is it? The gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, what's the thing about a gift? Typically, you don't really deserve it. You, you, you know, it's sometimes at Christmas and birthdays and holidays, and sometimes maybe you say, well, I got to bring a gift, you know, and, and, and you, you feel obligated to. But typically, a, a true gift that is given or received is something that somebody is not expecting, and they don't really deserve. But you give it to them anyway. You know, if, if we say, we're going to draw names at my house at Christmas, and all of us is going to spend $5 on a gift, well, I pretty much know I've got to go find a $5 gift, and I may just put man or woman on there, or boy or girl, or whatever the case, and I know I'm going to end up with one of somebody else's like that. But it's really not a gift, is it? We, we, we turn it into an obligation. And God says this Holy Spirit is a gift. It's not an obligation. That's the reason he says in Romans 8, we have what? We, we have an obligation to the Spirit, but not to the sinful nature. Because he gives us his gift. And too many times we feel like we're too obligated to who we are. To let God have full power. 
But God said if you want this gift, there, there's some conditions to it. First of all, you need to repent of your sins. You need to turn from them. You need to be baptized for the remission of those sins. Then I give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, I take all the bad stuff away, I wash it all off, and I give you something good in the place of it. I don't simply say, well, here it is, and pile it on that, but we want to get all, rid of all of the garbage, and then we'll give you something good to take up all that space. And, of course, the gift of the Holy Spirit is the Spirit himself. We've, we've clarified that. In first, uh, first Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writes this in verses 16 and 17. He says, don't you know, when we think about this in his indwelling spirit, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? You realize the original temple that was destroyed in 70 AD. God says, there's going to come a time where I'm not going to reside here anymore. I'm not going to just reside in a place that is built by human hands made out of bricks and mortar. That's not going to be the place where I'm going to reside. And so Paul says, don't you realize that you are what? The, the temple of the Holy Spirit. He says, you yourselves are God's temple and that, that, that God's Spirit lives in you. If anybody destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is sacred. And you are that temple. I, I, I bet today that many of you wouldn't think about going or coming to the Beulah Church of Christ building and desecrating that building. You, and you, you were taught long, long ago that you should what? You know, watch over the Lord's house, protect this Lord's house, treat it with dignity, care for it like it. But yet, God says, that's not where I'm at. He says, my temple is right where you are. You're my, you're, you're my dwelling place. And yet, we'll, we, we abuse our bodies. We take advantage of it. We, 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 we use it for, well, I hate to give away part of the next sermon coming up, but we use it for things that are not pleasing to God. Remember when Jesus goes into the temple and he says, my, my father's house is a house of prayer, but you made it a, a den of thieves. Wow. And yet we realize that the temple is no longer a physical place but in, in the sense that it's a building we're going to go to, but we are it. And, and yet we, we have let these things that come in to demoralize ourselves and, and, and we just desecrate the temple of the Lord. And we think it's okay. And we think because we live in this individual world anymore where you look out for you and I look out for me and I don't get in your business, you don't get in mine, that, that whatever I do is okay and whatever you do is okay. But that's not what God said. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've accepted the Holy Spirit to come into your life through, through, through saying, Lord, I want to have all my sins washed away and I want to, your Spirit to come into me, then God says things have changed. Things change. And so he, you are his temple. He comes in 24-7, takes up residence in our life. And everywhere you go, God's with you. Everything you say, God hears. Everything that you do, God's a part of. He, every decision that you make, He's going to be a part of that. He's going to be with you and He's in you. Because He's given you His indwelling spirit.